Okay, we're going to finish up calculus of parametric curves, and then we're going to start to talk about a particular kind of uh, way of describing curves, which is polar coordinates. And let us recall what we learned last time. So we learned that if we have a parametric curve where for some part of the parametric curve, it satisfies the vertical line test above uh, a certain interval, then if we want to rotate this part of the curve around the x-axis, that will form a surface of revolution, and we found the formula for the surface of revolution. And recall this formula was as follows. So if we are here at time t0, and say here at time t1, And this is the formula we worked out. We're integrating in t from t0 to t1. We have the piece of the formula that comes from the band, uh, sorry, from the perimeter of the band. So recall, we cut this up into little bits, little strips like this, okay, where this was some little interval of time, and we rotate this guy all the way around, so that's going to form some kind of a band. And the perimeter of the band will be given by 2 pi times this quantity, or this length right here. So we have 2 pi y of t. That gives us the perimeter of the band. And then we have the thickness of the band, and the thickness of the band is given by this expression. This is in many ways analogous to the formula for the surface of revolution where we just have a graph of a function from the x-axis, but this is very much not from the x-axis. This is a function, or this is a parametric curve which are, which are consistent of x and y, both of which are functions of t, not of x. Okay, so that was our formula. And we are going to apply it to find the, uh, the surface area of a sphere, which is an example we also did back in the day when we first learned how to do surface of revolution just with a graph of a function. But now that we have this new tool, let's see if we can get the surface area of the sphere uh, from, this, from this tool. So we know, of course, what the surface area, what the surface area of a sphere is. So uh, let's put it over here. Surface area of sphere. of radius r is 4 pi r squared. Right? This is a formula you've probably known for a long time. I feel like I've misspelled surface. No matter. <laughs> probably an r right there. Right? Surface area. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, so let's Draw this picture. So this is our sphere. Okay. And our sphere is what happens when we take a circle and we just rotate it around the x-axis, right? So this right here is the radius. So to use this formula, we're going to have to find a parametric uh, curve that describes the upper half of the circle, and that's really easy, right? So we're just going to do x of t is equal to r cosine of t, and y of t is equal to r sine of t. That clearly does it. And when we are here <coughs> at time 0, and I should have said when we're at time 0, we're here. And at time pi, we are here. Right? Cool. So that's all we need because as we range from 0 to pi, we get this upper half of the circle right here. And if we rotate this around the x-axis, sure enough, we get a sphere. Right? So if this formula is correct, when we do this, we should get 4 pi r squared. And let's see how this goes. So using the formula, we integrate from 0 to pi, 2 pi y of t. y in this case is r sine of t. And then it's going to be the square root of the derivative of x of t and y of t. So the derivative of x of t is going to be minus r sine of t. 
but we're not going to notice the minus when we square everything, so we're just going to do like r squared sine squared of t. For that part, when we differentiate this, we get r cosine of t. Uh, we square it, so we've already pulled out the r squared, so it's going to be cosine squared of t dt. So you can see that this will just give us 2 pi r squared. And x sine squared plus cosine squared, of course, is 1. So this is just integral from 0 to pi sine of t dt. Right? Once again, we get the r out from the square root, so that gives us the r squared. We pull out the 2 pi to the left here, and we're just left with integrating sine, which is obviously not hard. So anti root of the sine is minus cosine, so 0 to pi minus cosine of t. 2 pi r squared. Let's put the minus out here. So then it's going to be cosine of pi minus cosine of 0. Cosine of pi is minus 1. Cosine of 0 is 1. So that here is minus 2, but then times this minus 2. So sure enough, we get pi. this thing, which is what we hope to get. Right? So our formula gives us something that we already know. Right? So it seems to be the right formula. And indeed, the pictures from the last video, hopefully, um, are pretty reassuring to you that this is the right formula. Let's do one other example of this, since it is a slightly harder formula. <coughs> Let's do this one. Change color. Find. The so surface area is going to be abbreviated to S dot A uh, of rotation of parametric curve X of T given by T to the three, Y of T given by T squared over or for t, which is between 0 and 1. OK, so let's try and visualize this a little bit. OK, so for small t, x of t is a lot smaller than y of t, right? So they're both increasing, but y of t is going to be growing faster than this guy. Uh, and at t equals 1, which is right here, it is both 1, both x and t are 1. So it's kind of look like something like this, is my guess. And in this particular case, um, we can turn this parametric curve very easily into, a, into a, uh, just an ordinary Cartesian curve by just messing around with it, right? So. Uh, this is x of t, right? So then we have t is equal to the third root of x, and therefore t is equal to the square root of y, and therefore we have that y is equal to x to the 2 over 3, which, sure enough, does a kind of curve like that, right? So if we wanted to, we could just use the standard uh, formula for surfaces of revolution when we have a Cartesian, when we have a, a function from the x-axis. But um, we're testing our new tool, so we're not going to do that. So let us continue. <coughs> using this formula right here. So we need to differentiate this guy. So we're going to have 3t squared. And this guy, we 2t. And then we just put it in the formula. So th the reason we talk so long about the formula and try and explain it is because once you have the formula, it just comes down to stuff you already know how to do. It's just doing some integration. So the range of t is from 0 to 1. So we have 0 to 1. Let's take out the 2 pi right here. I'm going to put the y, which is t squared. And then we have the square root of x prime squared 
y prime squared. Okay, so we're going to have 9 t to the 4 plus 4 t squared dt. And that is our integral. Okay, we can do some simplifying work here. Let's pull out the t squared from inside the square root. That'll give us just a t, so we're going to have 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 1, t to the 3. And then we're going to have 9t squared plus 4dt. Okay, And this thing, now it looks about as simple as we're going to be able to do it with some, any algebra, then we're going to have to start to do some integration methods to actually calculate this guy. Okay, I'm going to raise the board and we're going to start again exactly at this point here. Okay, so we got to the point that this was the guy we had to calculate. So it might be tempting to think this is a trick sub because you see this uh, x squared plus or minus a squared type structure, but uh, trick substitution is a heavy machinery that if we possibly can, we want to avoid. So um, what should also seem possible to you is, is to do some kind of a u sub, right? So another good way to get rid of a square root is just to sub whatever's inside uh, and turn that into a u. And if you can turn the rest of it into some sort of polynomial in u, then you're very happy because all you're going to have then are just various powers of u, right? And it looks like this is that, that kind of form. So the moral is before you try, before you bring out the big heavy machinery, do some long, complicated method like tricks up. See if you can't make something simpler work. So let's try with a u. Uh, so let u be everything inside the square root. And then the u by dt is 18t. And therefore, we have du over 18 equals t dt. Cool. So we can pull out one t right here and absorb it. And then we'll have a t squared left. But we also have this stuff here. Uh, this should be 4. So from this thing here, we can write u minus 4 over 9 equals t squared. And now we're looking hopefully pretty good, because we can rewrite this guy as 2 pi, since we've now changed into u, we have to change the limits of the integration. So when t is equal to 0, we have 4. And then when t is equal to 1, we have 13 right here. We're taking out 1t and putting it next to the dt in order to get rid of the t dt, right? So that gives us a, like a factor of 1 over 18. Let's put it right here. And uh, we're replacing the t squared by this stuff. So we're going to have u minus 4 over 9. Then we have square root of u. And recall, we put a t next to the dt and replaced it by du. And the 1 over 18 is here. Cool. All right. So sure enough, we have something which now is just, on the left-hand side, a polynomial in terms of u, a square root of u. So when we multiply through, it's just powers of u. We can integrate that. So we can get away without having to do trick substitution. So I'll simplify this a little bit. This is 4. 13, uh, maybe I want to pull out the 9 as well. 9 times 9 is 81, right? So let's do that. And then what do I have? I have u to the 3 over 2 minus 4 square root of u du. And now I'm pretty happy because I can integrate all that stuff. And that's pi over 81. 4, 13. 
u to the 5 over 2, 2 over 5, minus uh, 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 8 over 3, u to the 3 over 2. Is that correct? Yeah, cool. All right. Then we just put numbers in, right? So if we put the numbers in. At this point, we get pi over 81. And then we have 2 over 5, 13 to the 5 over 2, minus 4 to the 5 over 2, and then minus 8 over 3, 13 to the 3 over 2, minus 4 to the 3 over 2. Lots of numbers. Well, let's not simplify it any further. It just turns out to be some particular number. Okay? This is nevertheless the correct answer. So, up to the point where we wrote down the integral, that was where we are actually doing something new. We are simply putting a, simply putting a problem in this formula that we now know. And then from that point onwards, it was doing integration methods, which hopefully we know. Okay? And this is a slightly harder integration than, than you'd normally have when we're combining these two new things, but it's nevertheless not too terrible. Okay, so that's it. That's all we need. So let's recall what we've learned about uh, calculus of parametric curves. We learned what a parametric curve is. Um, we learned to visualize the parametric curve. We learned to sketch the parametric curve. We learned the arc length of the parametric curve. That was the first formula that we learned. Um, we learned the area underneath a particular part of the parametric curve where it satisfies the vertical line test. We learned the surface of revolution of a parametric curve. And we learned how to um, represent the slope of the parametric curve as a dy dx, how far up by how far along we go. And we learned to use that to sketch the parametric curve. We learned what it means to be concave up and concave down uh, for a parametric curve. Uh, so there's quite a lot of things. There's quite a lot of things we, we had to uh, learn and become good at for this topic. It's not, it's not a small topic, um, but all of these things uh, are hopefully somewhat manageable. Uh, there's a saying that, uh, what's the best way to eat an elephant? And the answer is one mouthful at a time. And it's, um, it's, it's a useful saying, so this might seem like a lot. But each individual piece, hopefully, is, is somewhat straightforward. Right? So um, do not be intimidated by this entire topic. This is, this is new, but it's not in itself radically different or difficult. Uh, it's just... It's just a different way of representing a certain object. Um, it's, it's a way of representing things that we can't put just as graphs above the x-axis. But uh, if you are able to understand calculus of functions from one variable, graphs above the x-axis, then nothing about this should, should, should stop you. It's, it's very much the same game, but it's a different formulation. All right, so that's it for this particular topic. Now we're going to start to talk about polar curves, which is going to give us another way to, um, to, uh, to actually describe parametric curves. But it's, uh, it's a bit more than that, or it's a bit different than that. It's a very specific choice of uh, coordinates uh, for the plane where, where we'll develop a calculus in these coordinates which again will be a little bit different. So this is our new topic, polar coordinates. OK, so let's start at the beginning. So every point.
in the plane can be represented by two numbers x and y, right? by x, y, in the following way. So we take our axis, right? And if the point is here, say, then the x is how far we are along or back along the x-axis, and the y is how far up we are, right? So in this particular case, x is negative and y is positive, but we can we can find the x and y to describe any point anywhere, right? So if I have a point over here, then both the x and the y uh, will be negative, right? And if I have a point over here, then the y will be negative and the x will be positive, and here it'll be x and y both positive, right? So this is a completely unique way to describe points in the plane, right? Every single point has got a unique x and a y, and that describes that point. And that's a very useful thing. That's a very useful, in fact, we've been using this in the parametric curve setting, right? But there's another very useful way of describing points in the plane, and that's polar coordinates. And note that this x and the y are these two numbers, so x comma y, where x is anything in the real numbers, and y is anything in the real numbers, yeah? But in polar coordinates, now it's, it's a different game. In polar coordinates, we have r and theta. And in its simplest form, r will be positive because it will represent uh, a distance. Uh, we're also going to have a meaning for this when r is negative, but we'll come to that later. So r is beginning with 0. And theta is some angle, and it's between 0 and 2 pi. And how does this work? Well. If we look at our coordinate system right here, instead of specifying these numbers, we do the following. We notice that for any point in the plane, there are two numbers, different numbers that specify it. Firstly, there's this number, which is the angle, the anti-clockwise angle from the positive real numbers. And the second number is, there is this thing, which is the radius. Uh, and these are completely unique as well, right? For every single point, here's another point, then there is an angle, and that angle is whatever it is. Let's call that one theta zero, as opposed to this one, which we'll say is theta one. And let's make the picture better. And this is the radius R0. This is a different point, right? So this point right here is described by the numbers R, let's call this one R1, R1 and theta 1. And this point over here is described by the numbers uh, 0 and theta 0. Cool. And if you look at this for a bit, you'll see that this is definitely true. Every single point we can put on the plane, there is some definite angle it forms, even if we put a point over here, right? Put this point over here, there is this angle going around like this, or we could go in a negative direction, like this, like a negative angle if you want to, but that's something we'll come to later. For the time being, let's just go positive. So I'm going to angle like this. Okay. And that angle is close to 2 pi, and there'll be a certain distance like this. Let's call this angle, say, theta 3, and this distance r3. And then this point right here, is R3 theta 3. Cool. And you might think, okay, what's the point of this? Well, there are many problems where there is a there is a certain um, there's a certain advantage to being able to describe 
describe the situation with these coordinates. Uh, so many problems have a, have, have a rotational invariance. And if you have something which is rotationally invariant, then it's, then it's, it's not going to care about uh, the angle. It's only going to care about the radius you are away from the center. And you can simplify a lot of the calculations, a lot of the problem, if you can just not have to deal with x and y, but instead deal with theta and r. And um, this might sound unlikely to you, but uh, but this is actually weirdly powerful. I mean, this is weirdly efficient um, notation, and um, and I use it all the time. I use it all the time in places where you wouldn't expect it to be useful. It's it's almost as if the plane wants to be described in this system rather than in x and y. Um, so we have a particular brain where x and y seems to make more sense, but um, mathematically things often work out much easier and nicer when we when we represent points and polar coordinates. Now, there's a subject which I sometimes teach called complex analysis, and uh, and this polar representation of points um, plays a sort of key role. And the whole analysis in complex analysis, the whole complex analysis is, is like doing a version of calculus except from the complex numbers of the complex numbers. And the entire thing just just works out incredibly neatly, nicely, in, 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 in its, its own strange little world. Uh, and part of the reason that happens is because uh, complex numbers are points in the plane or can be thought of points in the plane. and we use a notation which is analogous to polar representation for these complex numbers and uh, and it, it just uh, it just makes things incredibly incredibly neat and and straightforward to calculate with um, so whatever resistance you have towards this if you've seen it for the first time be assured that this is extremely useful and uh, and once you get into it very natural all right let's um understand it some more. <laughs> um, some conventions. So uh, I said that we are going to take the anti-clockwise angle away from the positive real numbers, and the angle would be something between 0 and 2 pi, right? But it doesn't confuse things to allow negative angles. If you remember, the negative angles means we're going clockwise this time, right? So if we have a point, say, like this point, uh, say this guy is... Uh, 1 minus 1, right? So what is this? Well, if we go clockwise from the positive real numbers, then we'll have, we know that this angle here is pi over 4, so going, so with the convention that positive is anticlockwise, then we can think of this angle as negative pi over 4, right? So in polar coordinates, this point can be represented as square root of 2, because that's the length up to this point, right? 1 squared plus 1 squared square rooted. And then we're going to have uh, the angle minus pi over 4. Or we could go around this way, right? And if we go around this way, then what do we do? Then we have uh, 2 pi minus pi over 4. So what's that? Um, that is 7 pi over 4, I guess, right? So that's also the same as these represent the same point, right? So let's write that down. So uh, of 
minus theta represents let me start saying if theta is bigger than equal to zero represents the point where we go clockwise. Okay, from the positive real numbers. And you might ask yourself, why anti-clockwise? Well, anti-clockwise is also natural because if you just look at this, if you look at theta going to cosine of theta, sine of theta, then where do we go as we range from theta? Well, we start here, right? And then we get to pi over 4, sorry, pi over 2 way here, and pi away here, and then uh, 3 over 2 pi uh, way here, and then 2 pi way here. Right? So, as we just range theta, we're just naturally going around in an anticlockwise direction, so that's why we count angles in an anticlockwise way. Um, cool, another convention. If r is positive, then sometimes we're going to have minus r theta, and this just means uh, theta plus pi. So it's the point which is on the opposite side. So if we have, say, theta is whatever, this angle, this is theta, and then the, the point minus r theta, if r was positive, it would be here, say, where this is r. But for negative r, it's going to be exactly on the antipodal point. It'll be the reflection across zero on the other side. So it's this angle plus pi, which will give us over here. So this is minus r of theta. So this is r of theta, and minus r of theta is in the exact opposite antipodal point. And that's another convention. So uh, I started off telling you that r has to be positive, and theta has to be in 0 and 2 pi. Actually, we do have a meaning for when r is negative and when theta is negative, but we just we just make some specific specific meaning for what the what those expressions are and that's a useful thing to be able to do as you'll see later okay so how to go from polars to cartesians so polars to cartesian this is not so hard because if we just have r of theta right then this point is going to be r of cosine theta, r of sine theta. And that is kind of easy. So look, here we go. If we have a nice convenient in the first quadrant, this is theta, and this is r, then just by your knowledge of trig, right? So you know that this over here is r cosine of theta, and this over here is r sine of theta. And you might think, okay, but I just conveniently chose on the first quadrant here. Okay, but let's look. So if we are on um, I want to say the boundary of the unit ball, which is the set of points which have got uh, absolute value distance one away from the origin. So um, so I'm going to have to define this. It's defined as S1, 1 because it's one-dimensional, and it's the set of all x, y, such that x squared plus y squared equals 1. That's exactly the set of points distance 1 away from the origin. Okay. So if we are on this, then
well, we have a picture over here, then we see that exactly the polar representation is given by cosine theta, sine theta of any point on the circle, right, by the same reason I did over here. So this point right here is given by cosine of theta, sine of theta. This point over here is still going to be given by cosine of theta, sine of theta, so is this point, so is this point, so is this point. So if we are on the unit circle, then going from polars to uh, Cartesians via this formula is definitely, definitely just given by going cos theta, sine theta, and r in this case is 1. Right? So we can believe that this works for any point for which r is equal to 1 equivalently for any point on the unit circle. Right? Then this is the same. So then we have just theta, well, let me just do this completely. So 1, comma theta will go to cosine theta, sine theta. And for any theta, that, sure enough, does turn the 1 theta into the correct x, y coordinates, cosine theta, sine theta, just by going around the circle, right? So this is pretty easy. So pretty easy to go from polars to Cartesian. Going the other way is a little bit harder. Not massively harder, but you have to pay a bit of attention. So let's make some space. So, Cartesian to polar. Well, um, the R is easy, right? Because the R is just the distance away from the origin. I'm going to have the R is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. The theta, well, by this kind of, by exactly this reasoning, we know that theta has to satisfy um, uh, the following. So theta satisfies that tan of theta is equal to y over x. However, this doesn't uniquely define theta, right? Because if you remember the graph of tan, I'm running really out of space, tan looks like this. This is pi over 2. This is minus pi over 2. The graph of tan looks like this, right? So you might be tempted to go, OK, well, theta is just arc tan y over x. And um, that's not quite the case, because when we invert tan, we invert it just on one of its, one of its um, pieces, right? We choose this piece between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So uh, arc tan is this function which looks like this. If I squeeze it right in here, arc tan looks like this, right? It maps the entire real line between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So we only get half the range of possible angles with arc tan, right? So you have to think a little bit. So it actually is the case that if x is positive, so we're in the, the left hand or the right hand side two quadrants, then you can just define theta to be arctan y over x. Otherwise, you have to be a bit more careful because we want to get this range of angles, which is not just given between minus pi over 2 and pi over 2. So it isn't the case that we can always just write up. And I'm not even going to write it down in case somebody starts to use that. But it isn't the case that theta is just arctan of y over x. And we have to be we have to be more clever. And what I recommend is you don't try and be clever. You just take your x and y and just draw where they are and then count the angle from the from the uh, positive real numbers, count the anticlockwise angle. So I'm not going to give you a formula to that will in general give you the theta. 
because um, it will be a more complicated formula and uh, I think it's going to confuse people. So instead, just, I mean, getting the R is some explicit formula. There's nothing, 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 no problem at all with that. But the actual theta you're going to have to work out from the situation. Um, so just take your points x and y and look at it and s ask yourself, what is the angle to get round like this? And we'll do some example in a second. You'll see what I mean. Okay, but summary. Um, polar to Cartesian is very easy, just this formula. Cartesian to polar, a little bit more subtle. The radius is easy. The angle we have to think about a little bit. Cool. All right. Minus one, one in polars. Okay, so let's draw a picture. So we are minus one in the x, this is minus one, and we are one in the y, so we are over here. Okay, this is our point, minus one, one. So the r is easy, this is square root of two, no problem. And then we have to think about what the angle is. Counting the anti-clockwise angle from the positive real numbers, here we're going to have pi over 2, and then this is a quarter of pi. So we're going to have 3 pi over 2, right? Uh, no, 3 pi over 2. We're going to have 3 pi over 4. Yeah, this is the angle here, 3 pi over 4. And that's it. So. We can do that for any points we want, right? We just count the angle going round, and um, and that's it. All right, cool. So, polar curves. So, um, we can have... R as a function of theta, right? So we can write this as R of theta, okay? And then equals whatever. And that's going to produce an actual curve for us. Um, and it's going to be, it's going to be a curve that is, that is very different than the curve we're going to get from the graph of the function from the x-axis. So let's do the simplest example. So if r you know, of theta for every theta is equal to 2, then what is that? Then when theta is equal to 0, we're at 2. When theta is equal to pi over 4, we're at 2. When theta is pi over 2, we're at 2. When theta is 3 pi over 4, we're at 2. When theta is pi, we're at 2. So at every possible theta, we're at 2. Right? But more generally, if we have some function r of theta, so for different values of theta as we range from 0 to pi, sorry, 2 pi, we have different r, then we're going to get some kind of a shape, right? So if we are, let's change color, if we are here, if r of 0 is here, and then r of pi over 2 is here, then r of, uh, sorry, r of pi over 4 is here, and r of pi over 2 is here, and r of 3 pi over 4 is here, and r of pi is here, and r of um, 3 pi over 2 is here, and then, and then back here, r of 2 pi is here. Then we get this shape, and the only rule is that for every ray that we draw going out like this, there's only one value, right? Because r is defined 
for every angle, and every angle defines this kind of array. So just like when we have a graph of a function from the x-axis, it satisfies the vertical line test for each vertical line. There's only one point of the graph. When we have a polar curve for each angle going out like this, there's only one point of the polar curve that can touch it. Right? Cool. So it's a bit like, well, it's in ways a lot like the graph of a function, but um, but uh, a function on the x-axis, but everything is coming out from rays from the origin. Yeah. So, I mean, here's a cool example. If we have r of theta is equal to theta itself, very simple looking function, let's see what happens to it. So we're at zero, it's zero, right? And then as theta grows, r of theta grows, right? So it grows, 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 grows. And when we're at uh, pi over two, then this r is pi over two, right? And then it keeps growing, it keeps growing, it keeps growing. And when we're at r is equal to pi, then this distance here is pi. And then when we're at r is 3 pi over 2, then this distance here is 3 pi over 2. And when we're at 2 pi, then this distance here is 2 pi. And then as we keep going round, if we kept going round, it would just spiral, 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 spiral. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I shouldn't say that because <laughs> I've only talked about this when we have theta from 0 to 2 pi. So. That is our guy for so this very simple looking function produces quite a different interesting looking looking polar curve right and um it's a little bit analogous to uh uh well it might seem analogous to the previous topic of of parametric curves. Um, because this is no longer satisfying the vertical line test, but it is satisfying its own version of the vertical line test, which is this guy right here. But indeed, a lot of the ideas that we've learned from polar curves, from parametric curves, are going to be useful in helping us understand this. And, and in a sense, it's a particular case of, uh, of that topic. Okay, so... Um, that's one way to do this. Another way is that we can have um, well, that's the most common way. That's the most common way to go polar curves. So Let's do this following example. I might run out of space. Let me put things here. So, so, so sketch the polar curve. given by r of theta equals 2 cosine of theta. OK, so I am going to give myself some space because this can be a job. Okay, so let's give ourselves some axis like this. And let's start this. So as we range theta from 0 to pi over 2, let's see what's happening. So it's helpful to have a graph of cosine 2. So let's put the graph of cosine up. So cosine looks like this. So this is pi over 2, 
Yeah, this is pi, and then this is 3 pi over 2. Okay, so as we range from 0 to pi over 2, which is this range of angles like this, we're starting off at 2 right here. Yeah? So this is where we start. So this is r of 0, and here is, and it's at 2. Right, so it's here at 2. And then as the angle goes from 0 to pi over 2, the r, which is cosine of theta, right, the r of theta is decreasing, 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 right? So that uh, when we are actually at pi over 2, then cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so the radius is 0 then. So as we go along like this, so for each r we have a different so again, for each theta, we have a different r, right? And they're definitely decreasing. So the really kind of, if you're really stuck, the way to do this is to like give yourself some particular angle like this, and then just plot the point r where you think it is. So we could do that, right? So like this, and so whatever this angle is, say somewhere like this, so it's smaller than this thing. This angle here is somewhere like this, so it's smaller than this thing. But as you get more experienced doing this, then you can just sort of do it in your head. So, so imagine as you range the angle going along this part of the graph, right? So this is the angle here. And as you range the angle, then the r is given by this length here. This is r of theta. Well, this should be like, if I do that, then I should call that height 2. So this is a graph of 2 cosine of theta. Yeah. So our theta is decreasing, 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 and when we actually have the angle pi over 2, then it's actually just 0. So when you have an angle like this, which is close to pi over 2, then this r is very small, and when we are at pi over 2, then it's 0. So if we try and plot that, what's it going to look like? It's going to kind of look like this, right? like this, right? That's the shape we get as we plot over this part of the graph, or this, this range of angles, I should say. That's a better way to say it. So this range of angles gives us that. Let's change colors. So the red is harder to see, but, um, but changing colors is important. Now let's go from pi over 2 to pi. And what's complicating things here is that we have a negative r. Right? So I like to do things one thing at a time. So I'm not going to plot r of theta. So let me just specify that this thing right here is r of theta over that range. If I try and plot r of theta over this next range, I have two things to worry about. I have to worry about the angle, and I have to worry about the fact that it's negative, so it's on the opposite side. And I don't want to have to do both at the same time. So I'm going to plot instead r of theta absolute value. Okay, I'm going to plot our uh, 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 well, strictly speaking, what am I plotting? I'm plotting this point, and I'm going to plot this point instead as I range the theta from uh, pi over 2 to, two, to, to pi. So let's do that. So as we're going along, like this, going along like this, then r is 0 and then gets more and more negative, but the absolute value therefore is growing. So if we just drew the absolute value, then it's something like this, right? So then for angle which is a bit bigger than pi over 2, then we have this r like this, which is small, but it's growing. And then if we have an angle like this, then it's still growing more. And when we are out here at angle pi, then we are we have distance two. So if you do that, you'll see like we start small, then it keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing, keeps growing, the r keeps growing, the r keeps growing as the angle goes more and more towards pi over two, and it ends up like this. So this is this. Right? As the theta ranges from pi over two to pi, this is this. Right? I should write that better. Okay, but that's not our job. Our job is to actually plot r of theta theta, right? So we 
uh, have to now going to take account of the fact that that uh, that we just took the absolute value and the real thing has got a negative sign. So we were plotting along like this as theta range from pi over two to pi, but now the real guy, the guy we're actually interested in, which is r of theta theta. Let me take a different color. This one. The real guy is in exactly the the other side of zero from it. So the real guy, the guy we're interested in, is here. So when we're here with this guy, then r of theta theta is actually on the opposite side, right? Because r is negative, so the real guy r of theta is minus absolute value r of theta, right? So this guy goes to this guy, 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 and so on. So if we do that, then what we find, we find that what we're actually plotting is this. So this is the thing that we're meant to be doing. So this is this thing. So we put little circles around like this to indicate. So this thing is this thing. So this is the part of the graph of r of theta theta. as we range from pi over 2 to pi. Right? And when we back at pi, we end up exactly back where we started. So as we go and range the angles from 0 to pi, we end up doing like this. So I'm writing r of theta theta, but typically you're just going to be asked to plot the graph of r of theta. So that's just a convention just to uh, uh, simplify things. But what it actually means is plotting all these points r of theta theta, which is what I've been doing here. So this is actually, you'll be asked for the graph of theta goes to r of theta. Okay, cool. So we've done this part. And now we have to do this next part. Let me see if I can get some other color. Blue. So now we're going to do this part here from theta to 3, sorry again, from pi to 3 pi over 2, right? And we are here, but again, over this part, we have negative r, and I don't want to deal with two things at once, so instead I'm going to plot this guy, absolute value r of theta theta, right? So absolute value r of theta theta at pi is here, and then what happens as we go over this part here? We go over this part here. Well, we are going to go from 2, smaller, 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 to, th to 0 when we're here. So then we're going to do something like this. Right, with the same kind of arguments. So this thing here will be the graph of uh, theta absolute value theta, like this. And that represents this thing here. Right? That represents this thing here. But again, it's not the real guy. The real guy we're meant to be doing is R of theta theta, not absolute value. But all we have to do is to reflect it. So whenever we have this guy, it corresponds to this guy. This guy corresponds to this guy. This guy corresponds to this guy. So if we do this, we find that as we go over this part from pi to 3 pi over 2, we're just going to be looping around where we've been before on this part, right like this. Yeah? Cool. So that's what happens as we go from here to here. All right. Final part. The final part is from 3 pi over 2 to just 2 pi here. Okay, and now we're in the happy situation of having a positive r again. So we don't have to worry about doing absolute value r first. We have a positive r. And when we are at 3 pi over 2, then the r is 0, and then it grows steadily up to size 2 when we're at 2 pi. And um, sure enough, we know that this guy puts us here when theta is 3 pi over 2, right? So um, as we keep going from 3 pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2 is like over here, right? And we steadily increase, so this is, the, this is where we are. We are indeed going to be doing this kind of thing, mapping all around. So for example, this point here is the angle 3 pi over 2 plus whatever this angle is here, right? So this, this thing corresponds to this thing, right? And then this angle here is going to like correspond to this angle here, yeah? It's all the way around like this. 
and all that time, the radius is increasing, right? This is increasing, this is increasing until we get back to two like this. So, what does this, what does this parametric curve actually do? We start off here, right? Let's do it again. From zero to pi over two, we go around like this. From pi over two to pi, we go around like this. And the way we figured it out was first by thinking about the absolute value of r theta, and then doing the fact that we know that minus r is just reflecting across the origin, right? So from here to here, we're going around like this. So we at pi are back here where we started. So uh, r of pi, pi is actually here, is actually here, because the absolute value is over here, right? But r of pi is negative, so we're here. And then from pi to 3 pi over 2, we do this loop on this side again. And then from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi, we do this loop back again. So we're wrapping twice around this circle with this uh, parametric curve. OK, um, if you've never done this before, this isn't going to sink in the first time. This is a new, this is a new skill you're going to have to develop. If you're absolutely stuck and you can't, uh, if this just, just seems meaningless to you and you think, I'm never going to be able to do something like this, do not panic because at worst, it's just like going back to the early days when you're learning to plot a graph. You can just create a table. You just create a table of angles and then R of theta and then you just put in the values. I think I did some already. So we're going to have angle 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, pi over 2, and then we go 2, root 3, root 2, 1, 0, right? So then you can just go, OK, we are here at angle 0, and angle pi over 6, say it's this thing, if this was pi over 6, then the radius is root 3, like this. So I'll just do root 3. And then when the angle is pi over 4, which I guess looks like this, this is the angle pi over 4, then the radius is root 2, which is even shorter, so it's like this. And you can just, I mean, maybe do a different picture. You can just, for each radius r, so for, for each angle, you just plot what the r is. So pi over 6, something like this, pi over 4, something like this, pi over 3, something like this and then pi over 2 is like 0. So you can just plot them and then just put a curve through all these points. So um, you can't be defeated with this task. You, ultimately, you can just make a table, make it as fine as you like, and connect up the points, and you'll get there. But you want to get out of doing that um, because you'll be facing exam questions where if that's your method, you just can't possibly complete the exam, right? So you've got to build your geometric intuition for visualizing how polar curves are going to look. And this kind of way of doing it is, is one way to do it. Maybe you can find a different way that works better for you. But this way works for me. But whichever way you've got to learn to be able to do this, uh, you've got to build this mental muscle of being able to, to sketch the polar curves and later be able to recognize the polar curves. And that's one of the new things you're going to have to learn in this last part of the course. Okay, that's it for today.